Above uh, entrance, we need you to actually scan your wrist tag at the l lower entrance right here. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back, and I uh, hope you guys had a great lunch, and uh, of course, for those who went for the workshop and the talks as well, and uh, now we are back at the auditorium right here for a special uh, fire, uh, fireside chat, which is uh, titled as Rise from the Ashes, but before that, I would like to give you a friendly reminder on the special lucky draw prizes that we have, there you go, uh, how to claim your prizes right here, you download the app Bizabo uh, from App Store and also Play Store, launch the app and find uh, MA2017, uh, go to the surveys and tap and fill out the survey and submit it and you can claim your prizes at the redemption counter before, oh, 4.30 p.m. onwards, okay, 4.30 p.m. onwards. If you want to know more about uh, the lucky draw, you can always approach me and I'll let you know later on. All right, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's uh, invite for our next session right here, the fireside chat on Rise from the Ashes by Shafiwi ha Hussein, lead product designer at Mind Valley, Alicia Tan, CEO and co-founder at Tech Ladies, Paul Jambunathan, Senior Lecturer, School of Med and Health at Monash University, and the moderator by Tanuja Raja, Program Director of Global Accelerator Program at Magic. Put your hands together for all of them. Hi everyone, how are you doing today? Good. Did you have a nice lunch and a first half in the morning? Yeah. Okay, before I invite my speakers up, I actually just wanted to introduce them and also give you a little bit of a context as to why we decided to have this talk. Um, we wanted to speak about the psychological price entrepreneurs pay. And I really think entrepreneurs are an amazing group of people. You've all heard the statistics, right? Nine out of 10 startups fail. And yet, more and more people are joining the scene. They believe that their product is what's going to make a difference. Their product is going to succeed. And sometimes, it doesn't work out just the way you plan. In fact, a recent study by the University of California said that 30% of startup founders are depressed. And one in three, actually, sorry, one in two actually suffer from depression at some point or other in their journey running their business. So today we have three very amazing people here who are going to join me on this panel session, each with their own unique experience and they each have a viewpoint to share with you. I'd first like to introduce you to Elisha Tan. Elisha, would you like to join me? Give her a round, everyone. By day, she's the developer program's regional lead for APAC at Facebook, and by night and weekends, she's the boss of a very passionate project called Tech Ladies, a community-led initiative for women in Asia to connect, learn, and advance as programmers in the tech industry. Elisha was also the founder of LearningMe. Did I pronounce that right? LearningMe, right. A startup she founded in Singapore. Next up, I have Shafiu Hassan. Give him a round of applause, everyone. He is the lead product designer at Mind Valley today and formerly the co-founder of TechSeamonger. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Paul Jambunathan. Give him a round. 
a senior lecturer with the Jeffrey Chia School of Medicine and Health Sciences and a consultant clinical psychologist with Sunway Medical Center. I'm sure some of you might have heard his talk show on BFM, yes? Yes, yes we have a fan here. Right, well, let's get started by orientating you a little bit more about who you are, Elisha. So why don't we start with you? Please tell us a little bit about your background and what you're up to right now. I think it's on already. It's on. Hi, everyone. My name is Elisha, and um, I think there was a quick background of what I do now. So um, interestingly, even though I deal a lot with developers and also technology, I have a degree in psychology. And um, I'll share more about you know, the story of how I eventually ended up from like here to you know, technology. You mean here with a from? <laughs> <laughs> and how about you, Shafiu? Tell us a little bit about <coughs> your background, what you're up to now. <coughs> Yeah, uh, I actually lead the product design team at Mind Valley uh, right now. So Mind Valley is uh, uh, it's an online learning platform <coughs> that uh, provides uh, learning materials for things that help people uh, improve their lives. So things like mindfulness, nutrition, and relationship, and things like that. Okay, and coming from a very different background compared to these two, Dr. Paul, do tell us a little bit about yourself and your expertise. I am 59 years old and I feel even more older now with all of you around. <laughs> Theory of relativity. <laughs> um, I've been in the business of clinical psychology for 37 years. Um, I've seen and enjoyed a lot of human experiences. Uh, I started off, I've got 11 A levels, 17 O levels. My father tried to experiment with me as the eldest child in, to become a doctor, lawyer and engineer but I became a crackpot instead. <laughs> I, I, I sometimes tell people I am an expert in psychoceramics, which actually means crackpots. <laughs> and it's not a derogatory term. Um, I've also done sports psychology only because I'm very interested in human performance. I'm interested in performers in daily life, performers in the workplace, <clears throat> performers in relationships, etc. So I'm interested in peak performance and very much so the issue of resilience. Uh, probably that's about enough for now. Thank you. Okay, so I want to dive deep into this. So both you, um, Shafiu and Elisha, have you know, amazing jobs right now, but you had very different experiences running your startups. And I want to start with you, Shafiu. Can you tell us a little bit about why you started Taxi Monger? What was the thinking behind that? And then what led you to decide to want to close it and how you felt during that process? Um, actually, w um, how I started TaxiMongo was, uh, this was 2011 November, if okay. I remember correctly. I, it was a rainy day. Sounds <laughs> like a long story, <laughs> but it's a short story, guys. <laughs> so, we um, have time. I got into this uh, taxi, the red and white taxi, the normal taxi. And um, this trip, that I, we were going to Ikea with my wife. And this trip usually takes about uh, like eight ringgits. It okay. cost about eight ringgits, but that day, uh, the trip was like, I, I noticed that the meter was going really fast, so it was already like past like 15 ringgits, so I asked the driver, what's wrong with your, with your meter? And he said, nothing's wrong. And then um, at that point, I realized like, what if before I got into this taxi, I could know that this, maybe this driver has a bad rating or something? So I actually picked up my phone and started writing uh, basically an SMS-based app. So you um, text the number plate of the uh, taxi, and then it will just return back what's the rating of the car, the taxi. So this, that's how I started it. And then uh, I went to this hackathon in uh, December that year called Hack Weekend. So basically, I went there by myself and just built it, the first version. And then from there on, the rest is history. So wh what happened over those two years you were running Taxi Monda, right? Yeah. Yeah, what happened? How, how was the experience like in terms of you know, market take up? And then what led you to decide to want to close it, close it down? So there was lots of ups and downs, obviously. Um, I think the reason that um, we did uh, decide to close it down was um, one thing is obviously the traction. And also, um, I just wanted to focus on other things at the time. So 
that, that's why. Yeah, I mean, how I felt closing it down was obviously it's sad. Like, you know, when I left it, it felt like you've been, uh, you had a baby and then the baby's already two years old and, you know, you just left the baby. Right. Yeah. Okay. I know it's a bad analogy, but sorry. <laughs> Elisha, what about you? Lonely Mai was actually, you know, it, it got so much media attention in Singapore. You were in the newspapers, you were on TV channels, we heard so much about you. And you must have been under quite a bit of pressure as well when you decided to close it down. So what actually led you to want to start Lonely Mai and then what led to, you know, you deciding to shut it down? Yes, yeah, so about the media thing, one thing I learned is that media is not traction. Traction is traction. So having media doesn't mean that you have traction, which is what happened in my case. So when I started, well, I always knew that I wanted to start a startup um, back when I'm still an undergrad in a psychology degree. And I knew that as a graduate, I'm not going to have money to do an offline business, which is why that how led me into a, a tech business. Um, and I, at that point of time, I, I feel really passionate about helping people live a life that they, that, that's worth living. And a way is that I want to help people make a living with what they like to do. Sure. And I want them to be able to monetize their skills, which is why I started Learn Me. It's a online marketplace that matches the people who wants to learn a skill and people who can teach a skill. And that's how people can make a living uh, with, their, with what they like to do. So um, to do that, b without a, a tech background, the first thing I tried to do was to look for a tech co-founder. And that didn't work. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> good luck with finding a tech co-founder to join you. Yes, and that's how I picked up programming, um, with the help of a friend to to really build up the 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 first few versions of the application. So so that is also what led me to be exposed to the developer community and understand the open source world, what technology is about, what developers like, and how to talk to them. Um, which you can see now in life, it, it came sort of like a full circle in, in a way that now I actually do with developers. So I launched, got a bunch of media, realized that that did not translate to traction. And at a certain point in time, you just have to, the thing about being a founder is that you're always optimistic. Like, oh, if this doesn't work, maybe success is just around the corner, I should just keep going. But at a certain point in life, you just have to be brutal with yourself, like look at the hard facts. The traction is not there. It's not up and to the right, it's a straight line. <laughs> That's brutal. Um, so I knew that, and I wanted to be in an environment where I could be clear whether it's a time to move on or not, which is why I moved to Silicon Valley for three months. That's when I met a lot of a bunch of people because they have a know-how there. And that's how I decided that it's, it's time to move on. This is not going to go anywhere. So you were not sure as to whether you should continue learning my or not, and you decided to take a leap. You went all the way to Silicon Valley to try and get you know, training, maybe mentorship and guidance before you decided to close it down. Wow, that was yeah, quite a right. big investment, time, money, effort. It is. So the good thing is that um, my parents are financially sufficient for themselves, so I borrowed money from my mom. I still owe her some to this day. <laughs> <laughs> are you paying her back on a monthly basis? Yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. So, so traction wasn't there and you decided to close it down after how many years working on this project? Wow, I think it's about like three and a half year or four wow. years since okay. going full time on it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of like when you talk about resilience, you talk about optimism, where do you draw the line between now you're being naive versus being, you're being right. resilient. The, the breaking point was that first of all, I'm out of money. And second of all, I'm mentally exhausted. I just don't know how I can unstuck myself, get out of the situation. That's when I realized that, you know, it's time. Let's, let's face it and mm -hmm. move on. And that was the hardest part. Um, the hardest thing I had to do in my life. Um, because, because when you start a startup, you run, you do a startup because you're passionate about, about a problem or, or a solution, right? And, and one of the mistakes that a lot of founders do is that you let your startup define your self-worth and your self-confidence. And when the startup is no longer there, when your startup is failing, you don't feel like your startup failed. You feel, you feel like, like you're you failed. And at that point in time, I feel that like I'm a failure. That's the end of it. Like, who is Elisha without learning me? Right. And that was the intensity of like how I, the relationship I have with my startup, which is which what makes it really difficult to end it. Um, 
But you know, life has to have to go on, and and I took took a while just to just chill, just chill. And then it was really difficult at a point of time. I remember for three days I couldn't stop crying, um, and. Well, food, food had no taste for me for two weeks. I always had to do like hot sauce because it's, <laughs> it's California and don't have chili sauce. Yeah. So hot it's sauce, everything. Good. Yeah. Um, but eventually, you know, I, I do think that having a good support network around you, like people who have been through been through that process, people who believe in you when you don't believe in yourself, and that's really important. That helped me to, to realize that, yes, I feel it's terrible, it's painful, but it's not the end of the world. Yeah, I want to I wanna draw on what you said there, that, you know, the failure of your startup was almost like you felt like it was the failure of yourself. And, and the reason why I wanted to talk about this today is because this topic is actually really close to my heart. When I was running a startup for two years, I used to go to numerous you know, networking sessions, conferences, symposiums, you name it. I wanted to network, I wanted to meet other VCs, I wanted to meet other startup founders. And everyone I spoke to said, you know, my startup is doing amazing. We are growing you know, by 10 times each month. I'm raising Series A. I'm expanding my business to India, to Croatia, to London, I don't know, you name it. And I went home and I cried. I was like, oh my God, I'm the only one who is not doing well. It seems like everyone's doing well. There must be something wrong with me because everyone I meet is doing supremely well, right? And I think there is this, there is this almost this fakeness in the startup ecosystem. Everyone is marketing themselves and marketing their startups. And, and they maybe stretch the truth a little bit because you always want you know, this potential person to think you're worth investing in, you're worth giving mentorship to. Um, and because of this, other startup founders don't want to talk about the struggles and the challenges. And it's a very, very lonely, sometimes painful journey. So um, I just want to ask you, Chef Hugh, did you feel any of these feelings perhaps when you were running Taxi Monger for two years and going out to yes, meet other startup yes. founders? I think everybody goes home and cry, trust me. <laughs> I'm sure all of these guys go home and cry. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the biggest thing, the biggest reason is that um, we, we all want to feel like, you know, we, uh, we are being accepted by others like parents, spouses and all. So uh, even though if we are not doing great, like for example, the, we don't have a hockey stick curve and all growth, but we just make it up basically, make it up and uh, tell the others, you know, it's my time is worth it. And also sometimes that we lie to ourselves, like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm actually doing great in reality. I'm doing... Fake it till you make it. Yeah, yeah. If I, I, I don't know this. If I say it enough times, maybe it'll one maybe day Maybe you'll true. believe it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. And, and I think another reason is also uh, people go through this is because, like, if you look at any um, startup accelerator or the, the whole startup scene, they teach you everything, like how to make a deck, how to raise funding, how to talk to VCs and everything, but they never teach you like, you know, how to deal with the uh, mental breakdowns and all these things. I remember you saying like, wh one in how many people are, like, sorry, 50%? 50% suffer. I think that's 100%. I, yeah. I would say it's 100% I mean, people yeah, are depressed. Yeah, these are recorded yeah. numbers, right? So it must be much higher than this. Yeah, yeah. And, and then people think that, you know, some people think that, for example, if I raise money, it will get better, but it actually doesn't get better. It actually magnifies the whatever things that you're actually going through it yeah yeah um dr paul finally i want to ask paul, you paul. paul okay whenever i speak to founders and elisha actually just mentioned this just now you know their business always starts off as this passionate project and uh, they work on it so much they give their time they give their money they give their effort they call it chef you you called it your baby Right? And yeah. I felt like that when I was working on my startups. It's really difficult to separate your business from yourself. Um, how should startup founders go about this? Either when they're starting off the journey, is there a way of thinking that they should, you know, or approach the situation so that it make them easier, or make things a little easier for them as they're on this really difficult journey? Good question. Um, my belief, I don't know what the business gurus suggest to you or teach you, but from a psychological point of view, I think it's crucial that you definitely start working towards your own definition of who you are, what you are, why you are, how you're going to be what you are. Um, and you've got to be, you, it's got to be a calculated risk of how much you're going to use yourself as part of your business definition. If you're going to invest yourself rather than just your money, 
then you're putting your, yourself on the line. You've got to end up on the books. Your personality is going to end up on the books. I think it's an important aspect to consider whether your, your identity is being extended into your business and how much the business reflects you and your identity. Now, that's a risky, very risky business. Your personality, your resilience, your makeup, your, your opportunities to project and be yourself, come what may, will probably, for me, be the determinant of success or failure. And if failure, how are you going to bounce back? So the crucial bit is, I would first recommend that you do not involve your identity into the business. Your business has to be a business because you can sell it. You can sell that business. If it's part of your identity, you cannot sell that franchise that easily. And have, developing a franchise is difficult without an identity. So be careful about your identity. And if your baby falters and falls and develops bruises along the way, your baby's going to die. If you're going to invest your identity into your business and you have a crisis, you have an identity crisis. Identity crisis, not a business crisis. That's when it becomes very personal. And of course, that leads to things like depression, anxiety, generalized anxiety disorders. Your performance falls, your business falls. You become a demotivator for the business. You become a demotivator for whoever else, who else, whoever else has bought in. So the issue of how much of, your, how much of you is in it, I think that is a definite prerequisite. And um, Shafiu mentioned something else just now. He said, um, no one teaches you the, the, the intricacies of breakdowns and, and psychological issues. I think that's a key issue to, be, to reckon with in your planning. Um, is that good enough for, as a reply for now? <laughs> because I'm, I'm used to giving one and a half hour, two hour lectures. I'm afraid I might go into default mode. <laughs> Perhaps we need like someone here with a cue card to like <laughs> stop stop you, Paul. No, um, I think that's a really good point, but it's it's really difficult because entrepreneurs are a breed that only starts a project because they feel so strongly about it. You know, some way or another, their identity is tied up into that project, and because they have to keep, um, how should I say this, fighting for it, they have to keep. Um, being the cheerleaders for their startup, and it's not just to themselves. Many times it's to their friends who think they are crazy for starting this business, to their family who doesn't really support them because they've now quit their job that gives them a stable income to start on something that you know they're plowing all their money into and there's no guarantees of success. Uh, and also to themselves because at the back of your mind, you're, being, you're always thinking like, oh gosh, you know, my friend has just bought an apartment. I'm five months behind my insurance payments. I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent for this month. So you have to be your own cheerleader. And, and your identity, in some way or another, becomes tied up to your project, to your baby. right? So how are you going to, or is there any way that they can consciously separate their cells from this business so that they can look at it in a very... Objective. Yes. Big picture point That's of view. That's right. Is there some way to do that is yes. the question. Yeah. Yes, there is. There is some way to do that. When you have this ability to disconnect, because come what may, if everything else fails, if your car runs out of petrol, is it because you're a bad driver? It doesn't mean you're a bad driver. You were just a bad planner. It does not mean you're a bad driver. Well, planning the drive is part of being a good driver, but if the car breaks down, it's not you who's broken down. If, you, if, if uh, the foundation crumbles in a building, it's not because you work in it. No, it's not that. It, you've got to be able to disconnect yourself from what you're going to attempt to do. When it's viable, I think when it's viable, that's when I would suggest invest yourself. It's running now, start investing yourself. When I first came back from Australia, having worked there for a few years, I wanted to promote, they didn't know what psychology was in Malaysia at all. And I wanted to use the media. There was no handphones. I didn't have one. There was very little social media. So I thought I'll take to the airwaves on the radio. And I proposed a mental health program to Astro at the time. And they took it. But I, had, I was putting eight years of experience and education on the line. Thank God I was on radio, not on TV, because I sound better than I look. <laughs> so my wife tells me too. <laughs> That's why the lights are always switched off at home. <laughs> Especially during the kuchu kuchu times, you know. <laughs> but 
I took a very risky step. And I, I used to walk into the studio with a bag full of books in case someone asked me a question and I wasn't able to answer it. I was scared because now that was identity with profession. I couldn't separate the two. But that was really risky because if you fail then, it's you who are failing. Your, your, your education, your background, your surname, your mother's name, everything's down the drain. And it was a real big risk. But I had to be confident that I knew what I was talking about at the time. And I was confident that there was no one else talking about it at the time too. Now, I was afraid professors would listen and question me. So I had to slowly disconnect myself from the kind of advice I gave. And I, it was a very tough process because it was my voice, it was my personality. But I was selling a message from academia. It wasn't me, I wasn't selling me at the time. Slowly as I got confident, I was able to be me on the air. I was cracking jokes, I was being myself, I was referring to very personal examples like this. And so I was putting myself on the line. What you, what Tanuja just mentioned is, yeah, you're putting your bank account on the line, you're putting your, your mortgage maybe on the line, your insurance policies, but it's not you on the line. It's not you, not, not your personality. You could still be Paul, but a broken Paul or a broke Paul. <laughs> but you're still Paul, you know. And I think that's an important step for you to be very objective about your planning. And there's something called uh, the failure budget. I heard this yonks ago about planning to fail. And a time comes when, you're, when you start saying, now is the time I'm failing. Okay, I have a budget for this. This budget lasts a little while. That's when you actually save yourself. And you're attempting, you prevent, sorry, you, you, you become uh, archived but you're actually preventing the business from failing because you've planned for that. That's, that comes only with objectivity. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, so I actually want to raise another point here. Um, many startup founders then, when they find that their startup is failing, they say like, okay, you go and cry, you know, you, you feel horrible, but then you, t you start telling yourself, you know what, I've just learned so much from this process, right? I'm gonna take all the learnings that I have, I'm gonna start something else, or I'm gonna get this amazing job, and I'm gonna implement all that I've learned into this new amazing job. And that's something that you did, Elisha. You got this amazing job, and then you got fired <laughs> from your very first job. So there was like startup failure after three and a half years, first job, and you got fired from it. How did you cope with that? And, and, and what happened there? <sighs> when life doesn't give you a break, <laughs> that's what happened. <laughs> so, so yeah, so after I start up, um, the startup failed, I decided to pick myself up and say, hey, let's get a job. And I did get a job uh, for about five to six months when I was let go for not being a culture fit. And at that point in time, I was like ready to give up. I'm still going to find a desk-bound job that's meaningless, um, that doesn't care about... Perhaps, like, at the point of time, what I felt was that perhaps the life of meaning, the passion-driven, mission-driven life was not, just, just not for me. And that's, that was another level of despair, um, which I thought that, you know... Which then I, I decided to hold myself back from, from not discrediting my entire future just because of that moment of, of a despair. So, I, so what I told myself was that if I, can, if I can recover from my startup failure, I can do it again, which I did. So, so the thing is that when I was working, I always knew that I want to start a startup, so I saved about 50% of my savings. 50%? 50%. It wow, was okay. really hardcore. I decided yeah. to keep to the... How did you survive? <laughs> Well, just, just don't break away from that broke entrepreneur mindset. <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> still stingy, don't, don't spend, you know, and that's how I kept my, my personal runway low. Then um, I put burn rate low, so I have a longer runway. So um, at that point in time, I was like, okay, I can still survive about six to eight months without a job. And I'm going to take my time to recover. I'm going to take my time to sort of get my bearings again. And that's how I started Tech Ladies. It was uh, uh, because I had a lot of time on my hand and I wanted to, let's do some, I wanted to do something fun that aligns with me. Right. And, and all the challenges that you faced learning, I mean, trying to build Learning Me. Learning Me. Yes, yes. yes. Um, so yeah, which, which again, I realized that perhaps the road to entrepreneurship is not quitting your job, putting everything into a startup, but perhaps the way to, the route to entrepreneurship is starting a side project 
Because if that fails, let's pretend that it didn't happen and move on with life. No big deal, you know. And and in and that also gives me a lot of time to explore what works and what didn't, what couldn't, which worked really well um, in, in my current life. So tell us about Tech Ladies. How, how did you, I mean, you started it as a side project once you got fired from your first job and something that you felt passionate about. Were you afraid to delve into this new startup because of the experiences that you had with Learning Me? Yeah, I, yes, of course, afraid. Um, so the things that, which is why I didn't want it to be a startup. Right. It's a side project. So, so you didn't label it a startup? Yes, I didn't. Okay. So I didn't care about the, the profit loss, fundraising, pitching. It was all just clear. Let's just do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Let's just see if there are people who are on board with the mission as well. Uh, I, I think just to, it, it sort of ties back into what Paul was saying earlier. Not, don't identify yourself with a startup. How, how I play is that I, I, I identify myself with the mission that I'm trying to achieve. And a mission can have multiple ways of solution, different ways to achieving that. So even if one specific way of solution fail, it's fine, let's move on. Let's try something else and try something else again if, if that fails. So, so that was how I started Tech Ladies. I didn't expect it to work because the boot camp is a very, one of the main programs that we have is a boot camp and that's a very intricate program. And surprisingly, it worked. A lot of people were keen in it. The media picked it up. And that's how the momentum drive from there. Shafi, what about you? What would you say is like the key learnings that you, you, took, you keep with you today or you took away from your experience with Taxi Monger that is allowing you to live a more fulfilled life and, and having this amazing job with Mind Valley? Um, I think the key learning is um, like if any of you are doing a startup, um, I would say just test things. I, just, just to add on to what actually Alicia said here, um, I think. Um, if you have a day job, don't quit your day job to start a startup. That's the stupidest thing you can do. So just start a side project, test the waters, like, you know, and if somebody says, like, if you have a bit of traction and then, I don't know, uh, if, you, if somebody wants to invest in it, just say no. Like, you know, I still want to figure this out. And then just keep running that side project. And once you have uh, a bit of revenue coming in from it, and then if you see potential in it, then just go and like, invest more and more time. I, I think this whole notion of like, you know, just leave everything, like leap of faith, you jump and then... But that's, <laughs> that's really what everyone keeps saying. Everyone or what keeps you keep saying keep that you reading, just you know? leap of faith, you jump, you yeah. probably fall and hit the bottom. And, and that's I've, it. I've actually read articles that advocate for a startup founder not to do anything but work on your startup such that you shouldn't go for dinner with your families, you shouldn't go to the <laughs> cinema anymore. And I actually have startup founders coming and telling me now that they feel super guilty if they take time off to go watch a movie because they should be working on their startup literally 24 seven if they wanted to succeed. And I think that's just really, really unhealthy. But that's it, what it we keep reading. It is, yeah. it is totally unhealthy. Like. Uh, Especially working 24 7. Uh, I mean, maybe 23 7. I, yeah, 23 <laughs> 7. Yeah. So, when I was working a full time job and also doing uh, taxi manga in the early days, I would come home and just uh, sit down and work until like 3 4 a.m. and then just wake up the next morning. So, it kept on going and on. And one night, I just felt a bit dizzy. And then the next thing is, I woke up on the floor with blood on my face. And Gosh. there was like a wake up call, you know, it's like, what the hell am I doing? Like, you mm. know, I could die. So, <laughs> yeah, trust me, death is not worth it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then I was admitted to the hospital for like, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> yeah, I was admitted for five days in the hospital and the doctor in like all kind of tests and said, nothing's wrong with you. You just have to chill. Yeah. Just chill. So I've been chilling since then. <laughs> It's not worth it, yeah. Um, Paul, I think that it takes a certain kind of person to want to embark on this entrepreneurial journey in the first place, right? And there's obviously something about these people that's different from the regular Joe. And maybe it is because they are this little different, a little bit wacky, a little bit crazy, a little bit, you know, believe in unicorn rainbows and the possibility that their startup is going to be the next big thing in the world makes them a little bit more prone to depression. Do you think? Definitely, definitely. <clears throat> the guy who's taking a risk is always running a fine line between sanity and whatever else you want to call it. Yeah. 
Um, Robert Frost's poem about walking in the woods and coming across a divide, and I took the road less taken. That means very few people have gone down that road, so you don't know the risks, you don't know what's happening there, and that's our spirit, the entrepreneurial spirit. We're willing to take those risks, but along with those risks come the challenges which you can't always overcome, and then you have depression. Feeling down is okay. Feeling down and then feeling good about yourself is fine. But if you feel down and stay down, guys, that's, that's a sad indication of dysfunctionality setting in. Be careful how you use the word depression because it's a clinical term and we've got very strict criteria to go with it. Um, falling down and f having a bloodied face, that's not depression, that's falling down. <laughs> but if you didn't get up and go to the doctors and stayed there and started becoming um, fungi, that's probably depression, serious depression. He'll need a shovel to scrape himself off the floor. But on the other hand, if you have depression, we can do something about it. But pure medication itself is not going to help. It's a great adjunct to psychotherapy. But having, a de having depression means it involves problem solving. Those of you who take risks, definitely you're walking a fine line between um, having a good time all the time and otherwise. How many of you here are scuba divers? Oh, we have a few. Great, great guys. I'm a dive master. I've got more than 3,500 dives. I've been underwater a long time. <laughs> Hold on a minute. There's something important in scuba diving. The most important thing in scuba diving is something called buoyancy. You have to achieve that to do any kind of diving. Now, buoyancy is being able to hold yourself buoyantly, maintaining a balance of sorts between what you want to do, how deep you want to go, what kind of risk you want to take, the amount of air left in your, in your tank. Being buoyant is crucial. Now, all of us need buoyancy. If you're going to run a race, you've got to be fit enough for a race. The astronauts don't go up into space after a big biryani lunch. You know, they, they get fit. Everybody gets fit for depending on the kind of race you're going to run. Getting into a startup is a marathon of sorts. Are you fit? Now, one of the things we need to do, I want to throw a name at you, and the name is Professor Martin Seligman. Martin, as in Martin, Seligman, S-E-L-I-G, man. Professor at Pennsylvania University, I think. He's the founder of Positive Psychology. Now, he, he comes up with a, with a model called PRMA, and he's added a V to that as well. PRMA defines how, how, to what extent you are flourishing, and it's all about balance. P is positive emotions. E is engagement. Are you in the zone, and are you engaged with what you do? R is having good relationships. M is being motivated enough. A is having a sense, however small, a sense of achievement all the time. And the V is vitality. So your health matters. You cannot do without sleep. I'm, I'm, one of my areas of expertise is in the issues of sleep. Sleep, you must sleep seven to eight hours a day. If not, please read it up. You're compromising all kinds of aspects of performance. You're compromising your immune system. You're compromising everything in your body if you don't sleep, including, most importantly, brain and, and uh, mind function. Focus, tolerance, everything drops, guys. So your health is crucial, especially if you're running a race like all of you are part of at the moment. Perma and your health is crucial, so must take care of health. Whatever you do, people like me, surgeons, pilots, parents, teachers, Everyone, even the road sweeper needs help. Oh, sorry, good health. So that's an issue about depression and etc. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um, we just have about 20 odd minutes left, and um, I'm going to take a little questions from the audience. But first, we have a couple of questions from Facebook Live. And the first actually is for you, Elisha. Um, as a CEO, how do you manage your staff? I know it's yeah, I know it doesn't have much to do with rise from the ashes, but maybe something that you can share with the audience. Staff as in? The people you work with, your team. Um, for tech ladies? Yeah. So, so it's volunteer run. So right now, it's, it's a passion project. It's not like a, it's not like a, it's not like a, a company now. So okay. um, volunteer management is a, is a different, is a different monster altogether because these are not, People are here in, because they are intrinsically motivated. So they believe in the mission. So the kind of a structure and kind of motivation is very different from employees. Um, 
which to answer the question, I don't really have the, I don't have a winning formula yet. But right now, definitely, what I think it works is having a strong structure of what volunteer, um, what what are the roles of a, of a volunteers? What are they supposed to do? As a sort of like a manager of sorts, I also mm -hmm. have to have to fine tune my own expectations mm -hmm. because vol volunteers are volunteers. Life happens, right? So it's not something that I could hold them to, you know. And and this is a different kind of expectations. Sure, or not. sure. Um, Shafi, you, you mentioned something earlier about. Don't quit, in, don't quit your day job, start a side project, and get a yes, little yes. traction. And so I have a question from, for you from Kum Ping Han, and he says, I'm having challenges focusing on my day job because of my side project. Any suggestions or power tips to overcome this? Um, I think the last thing you can do with a side project in your day job is uh, to mix those two up. Because if you mix your side project into your day job, your performance is going to go down and then in the end you will get fired. So <laughs> you want to leave your day job on your own terms basically. So what I would suggest is just to try and separate those two as much as you can. I know this is, this is such a cliche thing to say but it's, it's not as easy as that because you always keep thinking about this thing. So well you can think about things like ideas and Maybe you can write those things down, but when you get to home from work and then work on your side project. Yeah. yeah, so maybe I could chip in because right now I have two careers. Mm -hmm. One is uh, at Facebook and also the other one is at Tech Ladies, my passion project. The, it sounds really sad, but I eat almost three meals at my desk uh, to work on Tech Ladies stuff and also add in about one to two hours every day after work just to work on Tech Ladies stuff. Of course, the weekends is Tech Ladies and social. So um, it's going to be tough. It's not easy. But if something that you care about, it's, it's a different kind of uh, happiness in terms of fulfillment because of the joy that, that I derive from doing those two things. Do you think having a very structured day helps? I, I read an article yesterday about Dan Brown, the author Dan Brown's um, you know, daily schedule. And he gets up apparently at 4 a.m. every morning. He makes this super healthy blended juice full of spinach and kale and blueberries and chia seeds. And then he's at his computer by 6. And he actually makes his computer freeze every 60 minutes so that he has, I think, a minute or two to do push-ups or sit-ups and you know, to go take a toilet break and then to come back. And he does this continuously until 12 p.m. But from 12 p.m. onwards is his like, chill time. Yeah, I mean, that's like a really structured um, daily plan. Do you think that would help, Paul? Definitely. Structure always helps. Overstructure doesn't. <laughs> if you get too rigid, it doesn't. Is Dan Brown's life overstructured? Uh, it sounds like <laughs> it, he's down to the minute. <laughs> yeah, it is. But if he's, if he's that way obsessive and compulsive about things, and it works, it works. If, he, if, he's, if your OC, obsessive compulsive behavior, becomes dysfunctional, then we have to call it OCD which is disorder, yeah? That's when you need help. I wanted to add on to the day job and, the other, and your passion. When I came back from Australia, there was no clinical psychology clinic at all in the country. I was a startup, but I found myself teaching first. And teaching was my day job. I got into the university in IMU, and then I got into Monash University. And I started this clinic. I was earning like $200 in the clinic. And nobody knew what it was. I couldn't register the clinic in the register of businesses. He said, Appa itu psychology. I said, I'm a high-tech bomo. Then he understood. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but guys, um, he's right. He's right. Because I started my clinic slowly and I was still at the university. And then the hospital said, oh, we don't need psychology. They were not ready for psychology. So I had, it was a shutdown. Then I went to another hospital and sold it again, and it picked up, and I was earning five figures in that hospital with a retainer. And then they decided, you're not bringing enough clients, shut down. So I had four clinics shut down in my face. And it's still being shut down. It's still being shut down because the hospitals don't believe in it that much. It has to be a money churner. Now, psychology, I don't earn enough money in psychology. I earn it from my day job. But my day job has now been restructured enough where I have certain time off in the week. I've gone fractional rather than full time. And I have time to invest. Now I'm taking time off to invest. 
I've started my own clinic, not dependent on a hospital any longer because I know there's a need. But you need to have the stability, something to fall back on at any time. Now, that is almost my academic identity. It gives me strength in what I do as well. Um, I'm starting up, I just told Tanuja a few weeks ago, I'm involved in another startup which is to do with psychology, but I'm starting a very special kind of tuition center. It's not tuition per se, but teaching soft skills from a very strong psychological point of view. Um, yeah, so I'm looking for candidates. <laughs> People with the money to invest. <laughs> no, the important thing is, I faced failure many times. Hospitals tell you within a month, enough, goodbye Joe. The hospital I'm in kept me for a year, very handsome retention, retainer, and now they've just said, Paul, your time is up, we don't need you any longer. So I'm out of it. I'm back to my 4,000, 5,000 a month income from my day job. And I was in the teens earlier. Now, it's, it's a real slap in the face, guys. But I believe in what I do, like everyone has a passion, and you just have to keep plodding on. Now, don't give up your day job. <laughs> and you need structure. Um, having a support system also is crucial, I think, is in, on this journey. And I, I mentioned you know, my startup after two years, I closed it down, was really painful, but I had a very supportive family. And initially, when I told them that I was going to quit um, my science background, because I, I studied for, for Aeons in university, and they assumed that I was going to go on to do research, but instead I told them I was not going to teach, I was not going to do research, I was going to start my own startup. They thought I was crazy, you know, because... Indian family, so I have to become a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer, right? Or wife. Yeah, or wife. <laughs> preferably, preferably wife and doctor or engineer. But I, I chose neither, none of the above, right? And so I was like this, this crazy one in the family. But, but they, they, came, they came around and they were super supportive and I, I think I couldn't have done it without them. Any tips, guys, on how you build a really supportive network if your family and friends are not you know, that way to, to begin with? I'll say one of the things that really helped in building relationships is be vulnerable. Like, like the topic that we talked about, being fake and stuff like that. I do see there's a business need for that because you, as a founder, you're a, you're a salesman, you're selling a dream, right? Without yep. traction, you're trying to convince users to, to perhaps even give you money before the product is built. There is a business case for the optimism. But, you know, as a human, to build really honest relationships, you need to be vulnerable. You need to be able to get into a space where you can be honest. And for me, I have uh, spoken about my failures in public stages just to see like, how far I can, because I think this is a story worth sharing mm -hmm. and it's such a taboo. At the point of time, I was definitely concerned, right? Like, what if people think that I'm just a failure right. and they're not going to hire me, they're not going to be my friends anymore? But what, when I, after I came down the stage, I realized there's such a power in vulnerability. People identify so much with my story that they could come up to me randomly a year after the stage and tell me that I remember you, I remember your story mm -hmm. because I identify so much with it. And that really encourages me. It, it, um, I think that we can all be human because this is a tough journey. Definitely. And I think it starts with one person. If, if I perhaps had gone to one of those networking sessions and heard someone tell me, oh, you know, I've grown by 10 times last month, and, and I, I would usually just keep quiet or, or say something like, yeah, you know, we are growing too. Great. But I could have actually said, you know what? Teach me how you did that. I'm not doing so well. I need a little help. The, the other person might have taught me, it might have benefited my startup, or they might have said, you know what, we're, we're in the same boat, maybe we're not doing so well. I think it starts with one person, and we really need to stop this, this fakeness, this fakery around the startup, this journey, because we're marketing ourselves a little too much, a little too often. Um, I have more questions, and this one is from um, Hazel Desmond. It's a follow-up question for you, Paul, on sleeping patterns just now. You mentioned... She says, some of us entrepreneurs are 10 times more productive at night. Who agrees with that? I hear yes. Whoa. I know a few other professions <laughs> very productive at night. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's stick to entrepreneurship here. <laughs> 
So her question to you is, is it okay to sleep late, perhaps at 4 a.m., and then get up around 11 a.m., so long as we have seven or eight hours of sleep a day? Yes. <laughs> no. There is something that all of you should look up on the internet. Just Google it. Sleep-wake cycle. We have four to five cycles of sleep regularly. Assuming you sleep at 11, you'll have your cycle. You'll go down deep, deep, slow waves. You'll come up to your REM sleep. You'll do that a few times, and it gets shallower and shallower, and then you wake up at about six or seven. So you'll get about seven to eight hours sleep. Now, if you're getting seven, eight hours of sleep, and that's your sleep-wake cycle, you are displacing it from the 11 o'clock to 6 o'clock clock. So you're probably in maybe, um, if you're sleeping at 11, if you're sleeping at what, 6? 4 a.m. 4 a.m. Uh, 4 a.m. is where in the world at 11 and at night? Somewhere six hours behind. Okay, six hours. So you're probably working in Italian time. <laughs> okay, good. You're a good Italian sleeper. But if you're sleeping Ita Italy time and your body is working along Italy time, fine. But if your Italy body needs to work in a Malaysian time zone when your day job, then you'll be asleep during the day job time. So that's going to compromise your other times. Now this is also pertinent in sports psychology because if Usain Bolt wants to run in Malaysia, he has to start running in Jamaica, practicing there during Malaysian time zone when the race is going to be held here. You've got to acclimatize your body and all your biorhythms. All of this is to do with circadian rhythms as well. Now, your biorhythms cannot be played with too long. You cannot distort it too much. Your, your, your menstrual cycles, your sleep-wake cycles, your toilet behavior, everything is in sync. You throw one out of sync, and you are down the sink. <laughs> Seriously. You're in, a very serious, you're in a very serious position. But if this is routine, getting up and sleeping late, and you're productive throughout the day, that might be good because now it global, with, with globalization, there are a lot of people who are working in the night, throughout the night. And that's what I was referring to earlier, guys. Huh? <laughs> all these forex exchanges and all that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you saw. So, yes, develop a routine, consistent routine. Keep your biorhythms managed. But if you're going to sleep and one month later change, then your immune system is going to suffer, your hair is going to fall. Yeah, you'll have opportunistic diseases like bacterial ones all coming in, so watch it. Yeah. Um, and maybe just one or two questions from the crowd? Yes, we have one right here. Can someone get him a mic, please? Oh, okay. Um, we have one more up there next. Okay, how about you go first? <coughs> Hi, uh, I have a question for Dr. Paul. As you can see here, most of us here will sleep late at night. And definitely, we do not have enough sleep, about six to seven, eight hours, as you mentioned that we needed it. And what if we sleep about four hours during the night, and then when we do our day job, after that, we come back home and take our nap. We will equal to eight hours in 24 hours. So is it uh, okay with it, or, or shall we like stick to one shot, eight hours sleep? One six. shot, eight hours. Six to eight. La. But occasionally, like sometimes I work 28-hour days. I don't have any sleep because there's an emergency in ICU, someone's dying. Um, that's okay. Now, please remember this. People think if you have three, four days of four-hour, three-hour sleep, um, the next five days you catch up. There's no such thing as catch up. <laughs> Whatever damage is done is done. It takes three, four days for you to catch up, to get back to that normal biorhythms and sleep-wake cycles that we all, the circadian rhythms we are accustomed to. The issue is constant six to eight is good for health. Coming in with four hours and then taking a nap and four hours taking a nap, it disrupts your whole recovery system within the body. Your tissues heal. Your brains need that amount of time. The brain, the hardware, needs time to heal and repair itself. Bodily repair also needs to take place when you sleep during that time. The change in brain waves over that uh, six to eight hours is a very a crucial bit of patterning. And you need certain amounts of delta waves, certain amount of beta waves that repair the brains in different manner, different ways. So if you have four hours, you're not getting enough of those kinds of variations. Okay, just one last question. Is this one must pay. Come to clinic. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, 
if let's say we do not have enough sleep, what is say? What is the maximum uh, terms like? Let's say uh, maybe our body can handle like one month or two months. You can see the impact on us, like uh, in uh, Machi, our. Within a week, four or five days, you'll see. If, in fact, within 24 hours, if you have if you're sleep deprived for about 24 hours, you'll already have uh, clinical signs of deprivation. Your attention span, control, your focus, your bowel movement, your irritability, your, all that will start. Those are already signs. I think instead of trying to downgrade on your sleeping time, you should try to think about how you can structure your working time a little better. Yeah. We, have a, yep, we have a question right yes. here. Good afternoon. Uh, I have a question for uh, Shafiu and Alicia. Okay, and a question for Dr. Paul, if possible. I have two questions. Okay, Three, yeah. go ahead. Okay, my question for Shafiu and Alicia. Uh, you know how, how entrepreneurs are really passionate and driven, and you know startups face many ups and downs. So some of these downs are really lethal, and that's the end. So if you, from your experience, what is the science to know that this down is the end? When to know that your baby is dying? This is my question, and can I go for the second question, or uh, I wait to hear the answer Maybe first? let them answer this one first. Okay, okay. go ahead. Oh, when, how do you know when it's time to, to call it quits? Critical. That's a really tough one. I think it's case by case. Because the, when, you, when, you're, when you're an entrepreneur, it's like you're really passionate about it. It's like it's your baby, as you said. Like you cannot let your baby go easily. So when to know that this down is the end? I of think course, if, there are some signs, right? I think if it's compromising your health, there is a big red flag. You know very well that entrepreneurs doesn't care about their health. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, yeah, the this difference is like the between the the, like when I say compromising your health is like the difference between your startups uh, or your death. So, like you know, for example, if you uh, crash and you hospitalize, you know that you probably have to change some things. I'm not saying that when you the moment you like you crash and that's the time to close down your startup. It's it's just case by case. I and also it depends on the people because different people have different resilience. Like. I don't know, I mean, maybe you can yeah. try. So I can um, try and briefly squeeze in my three months worth of Silicon Valley knowledge. So when I go to the Valley, my, I want to meet people and I always throw them a bunch of data of my startup and ask them, would you pivot or persevere? That's the that whole theme of the trip, right? One thing I realized is that the more senior this, this person is, the more startup experience this person is, the answer typically will be the same. And it's, the answer is, it's up to you, All right? <laughs> the first few times I heard about it, I was mad. I mean, like, I spent so much time and money over there, and the answer, it tell me some kumbaya, feel good answer. <laughs> it's all in you, like, you can figure it out. So that was not useful, but um, somewhat useful, I guess. So again, it's a very personal decision as a, as a founder. You hold autonomy to decide when you want to pivot, when you want to persevere. So that's out of the way. A few guidelines that I found to be really useful is uh, two things. First, if, do you have the ideas to unstuck yourself? Second, do you have the resources to unstuck yourself? If the answer to both questions is no, it's time to go. Wow, thank you. Okay, Dr. Paul, first of all, I would like to say that you're awesome. <laughs> okay, wow. <laughs> I didn't see this one coming. <laughs> Okay, so uh, my question for you, you mentioned earlier that you shouldn't uh, subjectify your business. Objectify it, don't, don't let your identity involve in your business. Initially, initially. Initially, okay. When, when you're starting something, it's like you're defining yourself, you're defining your, your passion, you're putting all the efforts you have in it. How to avoid involving your identity? Is, this, is there any methodology you can do so? None. Because I can see like it's really, it's critical There's and no challenging. There's no formula. There's no formula at all. It's got to be personal, subjective effort to say that this is out there. It's not a baby. I, I believe it's, it's a theory. I, I, I don't believe like we can, we can really manage this. To, not to involve our identity in our business. No, if you're doing a startup, like I've done so many times now and failed, still I don't know whether the next one is going to fail, but I know I'm starting it off very objectively. I'm using my name to attract the customers. But whether the operation is going to be successful, I don't know. But I know I'm ready to shut it down at the, the nearest so inkling. Don't you feel that one of the reasons that you, you failed sometimes 
was like because you didn't involve your identity, you didn't put passion into it. See, that's uh, a hey, typical, very that's different a, issue there. That's a typical entrepreneurial question. Yeah. The reason why my startup failed was because I didn't put enough of myself into it. Yeah. You don't mix up identity and passion, please. Your passion can never be taken away from you. Even if the business fails, you still are passionate about that whole idea. Now, don't mix up the two. Your identity is who you are, what you are, your personal constructs, your, your family, you, that's it. It's got nothing to do with your passion. So scuba diving is my passion, but it's not my identity. People now identify, oh, Paul, uh, Indian psychologist, short, ugly, bastard, whatever, whatever, whatever. <laughs> and, then he, and then they say, also a diver. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. La. So it's, don't identify, don't mix up identity with passion. They're two separate things. But if I'm going to have a baby now, which I'm developing now, I've got a fetus in mind, and it's out there, I'm planning, I've even spoken to Tanuja about it. And I'm just thinking about it, it's not me yet. But when it grows, it's going to become me. At some stage, I'm going to adopt this baby and say, now this is me. Like my clinical practice is me, 100%. No one can take it away, it's just that people don't want to buy it yet. <laughs> well, the hospitals don't want to buy it, people are coming individually. But don't mix up the two, young man, don't, don't. Uh, be clear about your passion, be clear about your identity. Have an identity first. Find your passion. Thank you. And we're just about out of time, but I can take one more question from the crowd. Just yes, we have one there. A caring human being. Did you, did you all hear it up there? If no. you have a friend or a colleague, someone you know well, who is who's an entrepreneur but is a bad state of mind, what can you do? Um, as a friend, if he's really your friend, my idea would be go up and talk to him personally. And tell him that, hey boy, you're showing, showing signs of dysfunction in terms of your relationships to me as a friend. Or I'm even seeing that you're drinking too much, you're not sleeping well enough. You've, this is your third girlfriend in a month. <laughs> you know, you are, something is happening to you that's not you. Be aware of it. So bring, give him this opportunity of developing awareness of what he is. Maybe he's so deep in he can't see it himself. So feedback is in, important. Social support provides feedback. Three kinds of support, guys, like advisors. One is social support. The other one is technical support, like resources that you need. And the other one is mental hygiene, mental support. Know that those resources are out there. It is not wrong seeing a psychologist or a counselor for help. It just means you've pushed yourself to the limit where that is being tested. The greatest strength is to say, I now need help, technically, socially, or psychologically. Asking for help is a sign of wisdom, not weakness, guys. And please remember that, okay, so there's nothing taboo about all this kind of stuff. So, Go up to your friend and say, buddy, I think you need help. I'm here if you need so. If not, here is a psychoceramic specialty. Yeah. <laughs> and here's Dr. Paul's number. He works in, you know. Um, okay, guys, we're just about out of time. I want to thank you so much for being here today and participating in this conversation. And I want to thank... I want to thank our amazing panel. Can I have a round of applause for Elisha, Shafiu, and Dr. Paul? And, I, and just before we go, I want to urge all of you to speak up and speak the truth. Um, you know, this, this journey is really difficult, as all of you know, so we, are, we should be here to support one another. So give yourselves a round of applause for going on this crazy yet exciting journey. I wish you all the best and have fun. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen.